All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, the, t the technical title of my talk is A Model of Sinoatrial Node Cell Regulation by the Autonomic Nervous System, which probably doesn't mean much to most of you. Um, but it deals with mechanisms of heart rate control. And this will be a bit of a departure from the other talks you heard. Um, but I'll stick to pretty simple cartoons to illustrate these biological processes that I understand may not be very familiar to you. And hopefully you'll understand what I did. Um, so why is heart rate control important? Um, over the course of a day in any mammal's life, we go through periods of relative dormancy uh, and extreme exertion. So the heart, which basically supplies the fuel for our muscles and organs to function, has to keep up with these varying demands. That's why it has to, and the way that it does this is usually by altering the rate of the cardiac contractions. Uh, on the other side, in certain diseases, changes in uh, the subtle uh, control of heart rate have been shown to precede heart disease. So if we can understand these mechanisms, uh, we may be able to design better diagnostics to catch disease earlier. And also, if we can pinpoint specific parts in the system that go wrong, we can better target drugs to uh, repair these problems. So how is heart rate controlled? Uh, the heart rate is controlled by the brain. So in this illustration, we see that the autonomic nervous system, which is the communication network from the brain to the heart, actually consists of two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And these are akin to uh, a gas pedal and a brake on a car. The sympathetic system speeds up heart rate, and I've shown it with this green color, because green means go. And the parasympathetic is like the brake, it slows down heart rate, shown in red. And I'll stick with this color scheme so it's consistent. If we take a closer look at the heart, and the sinoatrial node in particular. It's called the sinoatrial node because it's located between uh, this big vein or sinus and the right atrium. And it's actually just a collection of cells, and these cells are spontaneously active. What this means is that the, if you were to place a voltmeter across the membrane of one of these cells, you would see a voltage that oscillates like this. There is a spontaneous depolarization, which is slow, up to a threshold, and then an action potential fires. And once the cells in the sinoatrial node fire these action potentials, they propagate through the rest of the heart, telling it to contract. And because this uh, activity is spontaneous and rhythmic, your heart continues to beat. Uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves synapse onto the cells in the sinoatrial node, and they change their properties, and that's how they change heart rate. So if we take a closer look at these cells, this is what the configuration basically looks like. Uh, the sinoatrial node cell is shown here, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves end in these bulbous structures called varicosities, which contain the neurotransmitter, which is released onto the cells, and binds receptors in the cell's membrane, uh, which generate second messengers, and these second messengers modulate ion channels, which are present in the cell's membrane, and these ion channels, in turn, control the currents flowing through the cell, and once you control the currents, you're controlling how quickly it depolarizes and how quickly the heart beats. So how do you model this system? There are very good models of sinoatrial node cells in their basal state, so without autonomic nervous control, and they typically have these components, a cell membrane, some intracellular compartments, a number of ion channels, and these are all very well described by um, electronic measurements of the ion channels themselves, and uh, intracellular calcium and other ion concentrations, which also affect these properties. So these, the model of the cell itself is very good. They can generate these spontaneous action potentials and they have the correct shape. But the problem is that the current models of autonomic control are phenomenological. And what this means is that they, will, they have the capacity to model effects of norepinephrine, which is the sympathetic neurotransmitter, and acetylcholine, which is the parasympathetic neurotransmitter, but this is done phenomenologically, or in other words, if you take a cell and you put it into a bath that contains acetylcholine, they have been able to measure changes in a particular channel, like this one. And in the equations that describe this in the model, there is an equation that describes the direct effect of acetylcholine on that channel, replicating this phenomenon that they've observed. 
However, that's not the correct mechanism. Uh, acetylcholine does not bind these channels. It actually goes through a second messenger cascade inside the cell, and the second messengers are what actually interacts with the ion channels. And this is what we contributed to the model. So we explicitly model this second messenger cascade, which hasn't been uh, incorporated yet into these models. So what this includes uh, are the autonomic nerves, so the, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, which contain and release the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter binds receptors on the cell surface. These receptors activate second messengers called G proteins. G proteins, in turn, uh, directly modulate some ion channels, and they also modulate the activity of adenylate cyclase, which is another protein that generates another second messenger called CAMP. CAMP also changes the properties of one channel, and CAMP is destroyed, it exists in this equilibrium between uh, the generative process by adenylate cyclase and the destructive process by the enzyme phosphodiesterase. And the last second messenger in the cascade is phosphokinase A, which is activated by CAMP, and it has a number of effects on the ion channels in the cell. So the way that we modeled this is actually also different from the way that it's been done because of our focus on mechanisms. And because we went down to such a low level, actually defining each component, we're able to use explicit measurements of various parameters. So you end up with a system that has a large number of parameters, but you have a fairly high degree of confidence about the value of each parameter because they've been experimentally measured. So looking at the numbers of the model, it's expressed as a system of 57 nonlinear coupled ordinary differential equations. Um, and it, it is a stiff system, but it can run pretty quickly. On my laptop, it runs in about three times time uh, using the built-in stiff solver in MATLAB. And um, in three times time, it means that to simulate 10 minutes of sinoatrial node cell activity, I need 30 minutes of processor time, which isn't that bad. And, uh, you know, it's not a supercomputer, but eventually maybe the model will get to that. Uh, and the number of parameters, as I mentioned, is large. I have 90 parameters, well, actually 132 parameters altogether, uh, but 90 of them are defined from explicit data, and all the parameters have uh, physical meaning. So, uh, for example, the cell geometry has been measured by looking at these cells under a microscope. Chemical affinities and binding and unbinding rates of the various components that interact with each other have all been measured, and they go straight into our model. Uh, we also have 42 parameters from implicit data, and uh, this used 60 data points and six equality constraints in a constrained optimization to figure out all the parameters. Uh, there are also other constraints that are not mentioned here, and that's basically because we use the, the functional forms that we use are motivated by the mechanisms. So there are constraints such as monotonicity that are implicit in this. So actually having 60 data points defines all 42 parameters very well. And what I mean by implicit data is that if there is a cascade like this where uh, component X activates Y and Y activates Z, and we know the relationship between X and Y, but we don't know the relationship between Y and Z, we have this implicit data that measures, you know, if you change X, how does Z behave? And from that we can infer the, effect of, the direct effect of Y on Z. Uh, so, you know, we built this model and does it work? And this is not, you know, we spent a lot of energy and effort in defining each component uh, to reproduce the experimental data. But once you couple them all together, you have no guarantee that it's actually going to reproduce the high level behaviors that you want. But luckily it does. <laughs> and uh, here's an illustration of the whole cascade. The er each arrow is actually a function that defines these, the relationship between the state variables, which are shown with letters here. And the particular meanings don't really matter at this point. Um, what I'll show on the sides are these lines that have two bullets. So this line means that we measured, that there were experiments that measured CAMP, and, or that controlled CAMP and measured this IF shift parameter. Uh, and that data looks like this. You have the data points showing IF shift as a function of CAMP, and the solid line is our model reproduction of this. We actually have a number of experiments that span various parts of this cascade. 
and all of them are reproduced very well. I'll just go quickly through these. Um, the red lines show the ones that are shown here. And I want to pay special attention to this one because this is the actual phenomena that we tried to reproduce. So uh, looking at the top one, we have heart rate as a function of sympathetic nerve stimulation for various activities of simultaneous parasympathetic nerve stimulation. So this top line is zero hertz parasympathetic or vagal stimulation. And you can see that the, the heart rate increases with increasing sympathetic activity and that our model reproduces all the heart rates. And this looks like a pretty trivial data set, but given the, given the complexity of the system and the cascade that's going on, it was actually pretty you know, surprising that these were reproduced. Furthermore, the data that we explicitly fit with the model are these, these four points at zero, basically at only sympathetic or only parasympathetic activity. So we fit these points and these points here. You can think of those as uh, a training data set. And these, where the interaction of both uh, terms comes into play, are like uh, test points, which we didn't explicitly fit, but the model reproduces very well. Uh, we also, oh, and I should note on, on this part, the existing models don't have the capacity to model uh, simultaneous activity of sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. So that was a novel contribution, as is this, which is the dynamics of heart rate. So in, in these experiments, the stimulation of either nerve was started at time zero. So you see for vagal stimulation, you get a decrease in heart rate that approaches a steady state. And for sympathetic stimulation, you get increases. And again, the, our model reproduces the dynamics of this fairly well. And again, the existing models don't have the capacity to model dynamics either. They just show, they've shown that they can achieve the highest observed heart rates and the slowest observed heart rates, but how you go in between those was not defined. And they, they usually explain this as uh, due to a lack of data, but we got around this problem by actually modeling each component and then putting them together. And that's how we arrived at the kinetics. So we have this model. What does it teach us? Um, first of all, it, sum it summarizes a large body of work. Uh, to obtain all the parameters, I had to read over 200 papers, and all this is summarized in a consistent framework within the model. Um, the model allows us to explain the underlying mechanisms of the high-level phenomena that are known to occur in the system. And it also points out inconsistencies in our understanding. For example, if you take uh, two components that have been constructed to match the data and you put them together and you don't observe the overall behavior you expect, you know that something must be wrong with these and you can target further experimentation to better define these uh, relationships. And it also identifies important aspects to include in future versions of the model, which I'll uh, talk about uh, in a minute. So overall, our contribution wasn't necessarily what the model can do. I mean, we did. Uh, reproduce these phenomena of the complete heart rate range, simultaneous activation, and dynamics. But the really big contribution is the way in which we built the model. And it makes it very amenable for further improvements as more experimental data becomes available. You can update the coefficients very easily, which was not possible in these earlier phenomenological models that had basically a black box where the parameters were all free and just fit to reproduce high-level phenomena. So in terms of future work, this model was very simple. We just modeled a single lumped sympathetic varicosity and a single lumped parasympathetic varicosity for numerical reasons. There's actually about 20 of these varicosities on the cell, and each varicosity is associated with six differential equations. So instead of the 12 differential equations that we have in our model, to model each one individually would require 240, um, which is a large, a large leap. And and it actually turns out that it would improve the behavior of the model. So that's something that should be addressed in future versions. And the second part is subcellular compartmentalization of these second messengers. Uh, we assumed that as soon as a messenger like CAMP gets generated, it immediately dissolves throughout the entire cytoplasm of the cell. But it's actually been shown that 
these second messengers are localized to little subdomains of the cell. And we, the way that we saw this manifested in the model as something that's necessary to include is that using the rate constants or the rates of generation of these second messengers in the entire volume, they were too slow to reproduce the kinetics of the cell. So we had to introduce these arbitrary speed up factors, which are a measure of how contained these subcellular volumes are. So again, adding subcellular compartmentalization would increase the, the complexity of the model, um, but it, may, it would definitely improve the behavior. Uh, so to finish, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my, my lab at MIT and uh, the institutions that educated me, MIT Electrical Engineering, Computer Science, Harvard Medical School, and uh, this is kind of strange, but I want to acknowledge the experimental scientists on whose work my, my model is based. I mean, I modeled this biological system, but I didn't spend one day in the lab actually separating cells and measuring things on them. And there's really a tremendous amount of work that went into defining all the mechanisms, and I think it really deserves acknowledgement. And of course, uh, DOE, CSGF, and the Krell Institute for all the support over the years, and uh, this wonderful conference, which I've enjoyed every year. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions.